I'm Drew Stevens, and this is from my professional responsibility class. And we're going to be talking about Model Rule 6.2. Sometimes when a lawyer's in practice, a judge will call you and ask you to take a case in their courtroom to represent someone who is currently pro se or can't find a lawyer. Typically, these are criminal defendants or maybe prison inmates bringing a habeas petition, something like that, but not always. So, but those, that's the most common type of case. Sometimes a judge will call you directly. Sometimes they'll have their clerk or a receptionist or a secretary do it for them. So we have this rule about this. Let's look at what your duties are under the model rules when a judge calls you and asks you to take a case. So Rule 6.2 starts saying, a lawyer shall not seek to avoid appointment by a tribunal to represent a person except for good cause. Now, I'm going to stop right there. We're going to have three types of good cause, A, B, and C. But if you don't have one of those, you have to accept it. You can't merely decline it because you don't feel like it or it would be sort of inconvenient or you're too busy or something like that. So the first is, representing the client is likely to result in a violation of the rules of professional conduct or other law. In other words, if you have a clear conflict of interest under 1.7 or 1.9 with the defendant in this case, that would be good cause. If your license has been suspended or you haven't been sworn into the bar yet, that would be good cause. It would be unauthorized practice of law for you to represent the person. 6.2b says, representing the client is likely to result in an unreasonable financial burden on the lawyer. Now, that's a lot, right? An unreasonable financial burden. This does not mean just that whatever you're going to be paid is less than your usual rate or that you're going to be disappointed with the amount that you could make more representing other people. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a situation where the judge is asking you to, to take a case that's going to be so time-consuming, it would mean that you have to turn away your other paying clients. And if you're a solo practitioner who's having trouble making ends meet uh, right then, that could be an unreasonable financial burden. So if taking this case is going to like force you into bankruptcy or have you get evicted from your off from your uh, the place that you're renting for your office, that would be an unreasonable hardship. But merely being uh, thinking it doesn't pay enough is not. C says the client or the cause is so repugnant to the lawyer as to be impair, be likely to impair the client lawyer relationship or the lawyer's ability to represent the client. Now, this is not just saying that you don't like that type of case, you don't like doing criminal cases, or um, you don't really like this particular defendant, it doesn't appeal to you. This has to be something very deep, personal, and visceral. So, for example, this defendant you've been asked to represent also murdered one of your family members, or you yourself were a victim of the same type of crime at, earlier in your life and you still suffer from trauma. Something like that where a, a, an objective observer would agree that you probably would not be able to set that aside and provide diligent, competent, objective representation. You won't be able to think clearly um, when you are their lawyer, but it does not count as good cause or repugnancy, just that you don't like this type of case or you don't approve of what the, uh, the defendant's behavior. Now, let's talk about a few of the comments that could show up as test questions. They have asked about this rule from time to time on the MPRE, so it's worth knowing about it, and it comes up in practice, obviously, if a judge contacts you. So the most common excuse that lawyers raise to try to get out of taking these cases is that they don't have any experience. They've never done, let's say, a criminal case before. They only do uh, commercial law or real estate closings or uh, um, it, transactional work. So a lack of expertise or experience in a particular subject area, that's the basis upon which relief from appointment is most often sought, but that's not going to count as good cause. The comments say merely being unfamiliar with an area of law is not sufficiently good cause to decline an appointment if the matter is relatively simple. We have a presumption in the model rules that a lawyer has acquired the skills by going to law school to look things up, to educate themselves and get themselves up to speed about something unfamiliar. And the fact is, everybody knows that if you're in practice accepting paying clients, that from time to time you take cases where you are um, that are kind of new for you or are something you haven't done before 
and you do the necessary background reading to get up to speed, well, you can do that if a judge calls you as well. Now, notice it says so simple. If the judge is asking you to take this incredibly complex uh, um, securities fraud case or something like that, that even after a lot of study, you would still be completely lost. That's different. But a lot of these appointments are pretty straightforward. Um, and uh, the understanding is anybody who is competent enough to pass the bar and be licensed as an attorney could figure out how to do the case with a little bit of effort and time. Um, if you insist, so, uh, let's say you argue that this is just beyond your abilities, the judge can actually call you in and have a hearing where you have to make a showing of incompetence, right? You have to, the burden is on you to put on evidence that you are completely incompetent and can't learn anything new to take on uh, this type of case. And the judge has to buy that in order to let you out of the case. That's not, that's going to be one of the worst days of your life, by the way, when you demand a hearing where you come in and basically try to prove that you are not competent as a lawyer to uh, just because you don't feel like taking a case that the judge wants you to take. And in fact, even if you prevail at your hearing and show that you are pretty incompetent, the judge could just, if the judge thinks you're capable of becoming incompetent, they could tell you, order you to affiliate with other counsel. This is, in other words, you are forced to take the case and ordered by the court to get a mentor who's going to look over your shoulder and um, check for errors and things like that. That's also not going to be much fun, and but you're still going to be stuck doing the case. Now, the comments note that uh, the other duties um, under the model rules are still going to apply. You don't get a pass just because a judge asked you to take a case. So an appointed lawyer has the same obligations to the client as, retain, as if they were paying you as retained counsel, including the obligations of loyalty and confidentiality. So you still have a duty of confidentiality. Attorney-client privilege will apply. You still could have conflicts of interest. It could present for you and so forth. And similarly, not only do the duties under the other rules apply, but also the prohibition. So an appointed lawyer is subject to the same limitations on the client-lawyer relationship, such as the uh, obligation to refrain from assisting the client in a violation of the rules. So just because a judge asks you to take a case doesn't mean you get to assist the client in uh, witness tampering or fraud on the court or submitting fraudulent evidence or things like that you still have to comply with all the rules that you would if the client was pay had hired you and was paying you. Now, can the judge make you do the case for free? Probably not. A lot of courts have held that forcing lawyers to accept appointments without compensation constitutes an impermissible taking. In other words, it's an unconstitutional taking that violates the takings clause. Now, the judge can ask you politely to do the case pro bono and you can certainly agree to do that or offer to do that, but they can't force you to work without compensation. Now, the compensation is not necessarily going to be your usual hourly rate. It will probably be whatever the statutory rate is for court-appointed counsel, for indigent defendants, and so forth. Now, what if this client is a really difficult person who kind of wanted to represent themselves and they d d d dislike you? Um, and so they decline, they refuse to have you as their lawyer. Well, two things. One, in that case, no client lawyer, uh, attorney client relationship exists. And that has a lot of implications. All those other rules I was talking about that normally would still apply don't apply in that case. So if they refuse to have you as counsel, then the duty of confidentiality um, will not apply. You're, you won't be subject to malpractice. You don't have conflicts of interest and so forth. But, the, and this is the second point, the lawyer must still fulfill whatever task the court orders. And it's pretty common when you have a really difficult defendant who thinks they're a genius and they want to represent themselves at trial, that the judge will appoint a lawyer as standby counsel, which means you're going to attend all of the preliminary hearings. You're going to attend the, the court because what often happens with these people who think that they're going to wow everyone um, in the, in their trial, so you get halfway through the trial and realize they have no idea what they're doing. They don't understand how objections work or the rules of evidence or court trial procedure in that state and so forth. 
they thought it was going to be just like on TV and the movies. And so all of a sudden, halfway through the trial, they tell the judge, well, okay, fine, I do want a lawyer. And at that point, how convenient. We have a lawyer sitting right there at their, the, who's been uh, standby counsel, who's been paying attention to all the proceedings and can just jump right in and take it from there. So a court could order you to do that, even if the client refuses to deal with you initially. Now, how repugnant do things have to be in order for you to refuse a case? It's not the money, but rather the lawyer's aversion to the case or the client that's the basis for refusal or withdrawal. The quantum of repugnance required to meet the good cause test is higher for appointed counsel than for retained counsel. And in other words, you may remember under Model Rule 1.16 that you can a lawyer can refuse withdraw from a case. It's good grounds to withdraw from a case under 1.16b. If it says the client insists upon taking an action that the lawyer considers repugnant or with which the lawyer has a fundamental disagreement. But here in 6.2c, it's a, it raises the threshold for court appointments and says the client or the cause is so repugnant to the lawyer as to be likely to impair the representation. In other words, this is a higher standard than under 1.16. And of course, if you are obeying a court order, you should just obey a court order and you won't be subject to discipline as is true with most rules. So uh, both under 1.16 and 6.2, if a tribunal or court orders the lawyer to continue representing someone, and this could even be when the person refuses or you want to withdraw, you, you must obey, notwithstanding good cause. So even if you've said, your honor, I have a conflict of interest, you won't be subject to discipline if you, uh, you're kind of covered if you are acting pursuant to a court order. Now, could you be disciplined for just saying no and refusing to do it and saying, judge, you can't make me? Yes, you can be disciplined. Normally, the judge will punish you through a contempt of court order, but lawyers have been disciplined in various states for refusing to proceed with a representation um, after losing a motion to withdraw. So what normally happens is they say no, and then the judge says, fine, you need to file a motion showing good cause and including if you're going to argue inexperience, we're going to have a hearing, a showing of incompetence. And if at the end of that, they still think you're competent, then um, you could be subject to discipline if you don't take the case. You're stuck taking the case. And that concludes our lecture about ABA Model Rule 6.2.